Now tribe of Reuben, of course, the the one who had actually was the firstborn, the one who was supposed to inherit the richest blessings, but he didn't. As you might remember, Jacob in Genesis 49 verse 4, speaking of Reuben, he said, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. Now all of this, brethren, has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled by Reuben's descendants today. And Reuben is basically France, as many of you, I'm sure, know. So, you know, the, my might, the beginning of my strength. And then he says, the excellency of dignity. You know, all these things are present in the descendants of Reuben today. And the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou went up to thy father's bed. Then defiles thou it, it, he went up to my couch. That's Genesis 49 verse 4. This one when it says, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. In Fenton's translation, it says, boiling like water in lust. Boiling like water in lust, you lost command. And yes, as if you know anything about Paris in France, Paris is known as the city of love, you know, not to say city of lust. In verse 1, Genesis 49, as you remember, this was for Reuben, this was a prophecy for the last days. And all those prophecies in chapter 49 are for the last days, meaning that the, these prophecies are being fulfilled today by the modern descendants of Jacob's sons. So... What is happening to France today and what has happened to France in recent history and what it has been going on in France, you know, in these last days is exactly what was prophesied by Reuben. Now, it is true, brethren, that France was the first of the colonial empires of Europe to acquire worldwide possessions, just as a firstborn should do. And some of you who live in America are well aware of that, because from its beginnings in the early 17th century, through the great expansion of the late 19th century, the French Overseas Empire acquired Canada, Louisiana, several West Indian islands, and part of India for France. Then, in 1763, at the end of the Seven Years' War, the French lost Canada due to defeat by Wolfe at Plains of Abraham. They also lost India to the British. And in 1803, Napoleon I sold the Louisiana Territory to the United States. Also by 1850, only the West Indian Sugar Islands and some scattered African and Asian posts remained French. So this is why was this, brother? Well, because of 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 2. You know, the British became the colonial power and the America, of course, rose to be the greatest nation in the world because, you know, First Chronicles 5.2 and 5.1, you know, the birthright was Joseph's. Even though Reuben was the, birth, the firstborn, the birthright now, it was given to Joseph and Joseph's son Ephraim, England and Manasseh, America, acquired all the things that France acquired as the first or, or you know, acquired and formed as the first uh, colonial empire, so we could say that. So anyway, the birthright of Joseph's after Reuben's incest with Bilhah, which is recorded in Genesis 35 verse 22, but also for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, 1 Chronicles 5, 1. So that's why, you see, that is why French are not dominant in the world anymore. They were at once, you know, the first colonial empire they were. But they lost their dominance over the world because the birthright, which includes the domination over the world and the richest material wealth, was given to Joseph's sons. However, you see, French, nevertheless, France went on to form a second empire between 1830 and 1870. So that, 70, that will be in the 19th century, when Louis Philippe's forces penetrated Algeria and Napoleon III seized Cochin, China in Southeastern Asia. And in Southeast Asia, the French pieced together the colony of Indochina by 1893, adding Laos, Cambodia or Kampuchea, Annam and Tonkin to Cochin, China. And also in the 19th century, if you might, might know, Tunisia and Morocco. Morocco, they still speak, there's still French presence there, at least in, in the language department. Tunisia and Morocco became protectorates. So the France's vast African empire, brethren, also including French Equatorial Africa, French West Africa, French Somaliland, now Djibouti, 
and the islands of Madagascar and the Comoros. So that was the second, you know, empire that France acquired. Now then came the 20th century, the last century, and in the 1960s and 1962, France lost 12 autonomous African republics and Algeria, and of the overseas territories, the Comoros declared their independence in 1975, Saint-Pierre and Miquelon became an overseas department in 1976, and French Somaliland became independent Djibouti in 1977. So, you see, they lost the world dominance because it was given over to the British and to the Americans, brethren. And what we see today, we see some, something that we could call travesty of history. France, of course, being unable to be the world dominant power, has realized that there is another country that is very able and capable to become a world dominant power. So in order to somehow sneeze, snatch away, let's say that way, snatch away the dominance of the Anglo-Saxon world, France has allied itself with its ancient old enemy, Germany. Amazing. Amazing because if you know anything of history between those two countries, you would realize the amount of hatred that there was, especially in French, against the Germans. Because just like I told you many times about the uh, history of Serbia in several fragments that I can, in the same way, France was attacked by Germany twice, just like Serbia was. Now, the First World War, Serbia was attacked by the Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and France was attacked by Germany. And that you might remember, they had a land dispute between the two provinces, Alsace and Lorenz. And Germans always had aspirations to, you know, to those two provinces. So they had, you know, brutal clash in the First World War over those two. By the way, France was one of the allies, and France was closely allied and uh, with Serbia in the First World War. And they were, as the Serbian army was advancing and 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 chasing away the Austro-Hungarians and Bulgarians out of the Serbian territory, France was followed, and there was a very strong, very strong friendship formed between the two nations in the 20th century, in the first, after the First World War. Some of the French generals, they just gave, made very uh, praiseworthy comments about the Serbian peasant army, which was so brave and defeated much mightier enemy. And some of the streets in our capitals of Belgrade, they're named after the French generals and French big you know, political figures. There was a very strong friendship coin between the two nations. And even to this day, Serbia reckons France to be one of their traditional, traditional uh, friends. What happened was, what marred that friendship, <laughs> well, let me give you another interesting piece of history. What marred that friendship was that Serbia became part of, the, uh, of, the, of Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia Kingdom. Later, it was the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia after the Second World War under Tito. And Tito was smuggling uh, weapons secretly to Algeria against France. That was something that marked the, unfortunately, that marked the relations between the two countries. But nevertheless, there is this old, old friendship still between French people and Serbian people. And yes, I have admitted to you on various occasions that I, I have a weak point for, Fran for France. Uh, I, I do have some kind of, I, ha I can say prejudice. I, I, I can say that France is one of my favorite, you know, nations. Well, because of the First World War and because of that old friendship and... Uh, because the French way of life somehow is very appealing to us here as well. We just love the good food and uh, we do enjoy tasty wines. And the uh, French sense of humor is well received here in Serbia. And then also there is the traditional hatred which the Serbs have against England because of the English shrewd and treacherous foreign policy, which basically sold us to Hitler and uh, did all sorts of things to their own advantage, to English advantage. So. Uh, you are not aware, perhaps you living overseas or, or some of you having even French origin may not be aware of these things, but I'm telling you those because they're part of our European history. So yes, I've told you many times I've got some kind of, I've got some kind of prejudice when it comes to France. France is kind of something that uh, when I say France, I, I feel like warm throughout my heart. And many Serbian people feel that to this day. In any case, oh yes, and I mentioned to you the uh, 
we had several projections of uh, for free of French movies in our cultural center in Serbia, uh, and all the movies we have seen, we were very deeply touched by by the plot and by the quality of those movies, brethren. If you ever have a chance to watch French movies, you know, with Serb English subtitles, do it. It's worthy. There are no well those at least those we watched they they had no swear words other than one S word. But other than that, there was no swear words, there was no violence, there was no explicit sexual scenes. Each one of those movies had a very interesting plot. It did have some lesson to teach us and uh, we, we remained under very deep impression, those of us here in Serbia, after watching those movies. So uh, those will be like the modern French production. And I have to tell you that, you know, compared to Hollywood stuff, I can tell you the French cinema production is of far greater quality and with much more realistic uh, a picture of life, real life, rather than projecting us some imaginary kind of fictitious ways of life. Anyway, so France, France lost its world dominance due to Joseph Sanz. Sadly, France, as I said, has allied itself with its old enemy Germany because they realized that with Germans, they can actually acquire the uh, worldwide prestige. And actually, what is you need to understand, brethren, it's true as well. It does sadden me, knowing that France is part of Israel, lost Israel. You need to understand that this alliance between France and Germany is actually the axis of modern Europe. So this European integration now, integration of all the European nations, is basically based on this French-Franco-German alliance which is a real travesty of history, but that's as it is. You see, in its jealousy toward the Anglo-Saxon world, because they've lost the, uh, the birthright, the French are now allied with the enemies, their traditional enemies, and also the enemies of the Anglo-Saxon world. Sad, but that's the case. Now, France also, you should know how, nevertheless, they, uh, in, when it comes to economic wealth, France, indeed, uh, is part of the economic well-off countries and as you know there's many much much immigration has been there you know, many immigrants who have been trying especially those from the former french colonies who have been trying to get to the mainland france now france is the world's largest producer of wine and mild and butter <laughs> we're talking about butter before the uh, before the uh, uh the study so here it is they're the world's largest producer you know, of butter as well and they're also the fourth largest producers of cheese we talked about cheese barley and wool France is also, as you see, a great industrial and commercial nation, and it is the world's fourth largest producers of cars. Did you know that? Uh, well, perhaps those French cars may not be in your American market, but here in Serbia, Peugeot, famous, famous Peugeot, Renault, and other French marks were very popular. Now, France also ra ranks like fifth, that would be like in the 80s, that, those are, those are the uh, data from the 80s, nevertheless. They were like fifth world exporters. Their gross domestic product in you know, ranks fourth. France was and probably still is the fifth largest uh, industrial producer. The agriculture is well protected by the uh, by the government, by the way. So uh, and they they're very jealous about our, their agricultural produce, which I think is the largest in Europe. It was the fourth largest uh, 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 country when it comes to cars. Sixth for electricity. It was the second for nuclear power. France is a major agricultural country, the fifth with respect to beef and wheat, first in Europe, by the way, the first and second for wine and sugar beet. And it is the largest country in Western Europe, and French is second only to English as an international language. That was, you know, <laughs> that was one of the data which says, I'm not sure about that anymore, because I think that Spanish is, has gained quite popularity, and uh, I'm not sure that French is as... Uh, widely spoken as Spanish is. But nevertheless, French is still very much pre present in many parts of the world. Now, Jacob was certainly correct in describing Reuben as having might, strength, and power. So they're still very powerful. Uh, they're still very present in the world politics, now allied with their traditional enemies. And also, Reuben said about excellency of dignity or excellence, excel, excelling in beauty, Fenton, oh, excelling in beauty. If you know anything about France, you will remember one of the major products of France will be perfumes. 
French perfumes. They're <laughs> renowned even in the Middle Ages, let alone now. Also, there is uh, excellency of dignity can be also translated as ex exceeding in rank or excessively proud. Well, you may wonder what does that mean? Well, it means, brethren, for many centuries, France has been synonymous with civilization. And for much of the, this time, it not only was the foremost political power in Europe, but also led the way in the arts and in literature, in social manners, in fashion, and in the refined enjoyment of living. French are known for that. And we here in Serbia do admire them for that as well. In fact, Paris was, uh, once upon a time, uh, the city where many Serbian artists and scientists would go for education or just to live there. It was a paradise, so to speak, for the Serbian nation. Nowadays, it seems that Vienna, <laughs> Vienna, interesting enough, capital of Austria, has taken place of Paris. Nevertheless, France also exported its language and its sophistication to the drawing rooms and palaces of Europe. So that in the 19th century, brethren, did you know this? In 19th century, St. Petersburg in Russia... In that city, French, rather than Russian, was the preferred language. And all the Russian aristocracy of the 19th century did speak French, brethren. That might surpri surprise you, but that, that, that's the case. In Tolstoy's works, you'll find that. By the way, speaking of Tolstoy, Tolstoy was a Sabbath keeper. Did you know that? I'm sure you didn't. He was a Sabbath keeper. He gave up on the Russian Orthodox Church. He was eating clean meats, by the way. And so he died in kind of solitary life because he realized Sabbath was the day of rest. Of course, it's being hushed-hushed in the Orthodox world, but uh, I've learned this from the Sabbath keepers. And by reading some of Tolstoy's works, yeah, you can... He doesn't say it explicitly, but you can indeed... You can indeed detect his change of character and his turning to the Bible and to the God of the Bible. So how much did he know about it? We don't know. Whether we'll see him in the first resurrection, I cannot guarantee. But, you know, you should know that he was a Sabbath keeper. That might be a new piece of information for you. So anyway, French was spoken in Russian aristocratic circles, brethren. Paris became the world's most brilliant capital. French rational thought set a standard for Europe in the work of Voltaire and others. And French sensibility in the novels of Proust and the art of Impressionist. Impressionism, yes, was dominate, domina, domineering art in Europe for quite some time. And the, it was the birthplace of Impressionism was, of course, France. France also is well known for cuisine. Beautiful cuisine. They have tasty meals, tasty dishes. And they have colonized, they have colonized you know, the kitchens of the world's greatest restaurants. And from what I told you and from in my contact with you, I've realized that many of the things that we have in our Serbian national cuisine, we also took it from France. Which is a good example, I would say, for some other nations. I will not name which ones, but it's a good one for some other nations to also take some good advice. So, you, you know, and also France is well known for something else. You know, French lovers have built up unrivaled, <laughs> though not always justified, reputation for gallantry and finesse. So, uh, you know, that's French lovers. Yes, you might have heard about that. Uh, in your parts of the world, when you, live, you have the Latino, Latino lovers, of course. Yeah, they're also well known for their charm. Well, French people are, you know, French lovers were known for their, you know, gallantry and finesse. And as I told you, Paris is, was called the city of love and various people, and they would go to the honeymoon and stuff. Where would they go? Even some Serbian couples, they would go to France, to Paris. But what is the weakness of French? Well, what it says in what it says in the prophecy of Jacob, their notorious individualism is at once their strength and their weakness. It is the source of their vitality, but it also leads them into endless destructive conflicts with each other. Oh, how much this <laughs> reminds me of of even our Serbian society and as you know, there are plenty of lost Israelites and many of them must be Reubenites in our country. French people lack some of the more disciplined civic virtues. That's <laughs> where is this where is this information coming from from Encyclopedia Americana by the way volume 11 page 690 or you know in other words as Jacob said they're unstable as water because Jacob said unstable as water thou shall not excel and there is an implied sexual connotation in that water boils like lust as we can see in Fenton's Fenton's translation but we also see instability when it comes to France and French in other ways too, brethren. 
Well, between 1792 and 1958, the structure of the French government changed in many ways. You know, in the last century alone, France has been involved in two world wars, which resulted in a combined loss of about two million men. A four-year occupation by a foreign power, that was in the Second World War, and three major changes of political institutions. During the 19th century, the French government altered, alternated, better said, between empire, kingdom, and republic. As a nation, France capitulated to Germany. This is another shameful part of French history, I would say. But nothing new, brethren, if, you, if we know the Bible. We would understand that. As a nation, France capitulated to Germany in 37 days in World War II. The famous, of good reputation, French army was totally powerless. Paris was conquered without one bullet shot. Quite amazing. But you see, brethren, even anciently, if you go to Judges chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, you might remember Devorah, as she was one of the prophetess and she was liberating Israel, she was one of the judges. If you go to Judges 5, 15 and 16, you will see that even anciently, Reuben, we read that Reuben was absent from battle when he was needed. And yes, Reuben was very needed in the Second World War, oh indeed. But Reuben was absent, Judges 5, 15. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why abidest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flock? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Judges 5, 15 and 16. So anciently they were absent from the battle. Brethren, they will also be absent in the soon coming Jacob's trouble. They'll be absent from protecting their brethren, British and Americans. Now Moses also prophesied, you remember Deuteronomy 33, that's the prophecy of Moses about all the tribes of Israel in these last days. So their descendants today, including Reuben's descendants, must be fulfilling those prophecies. Moses, Deuteronomy 33, verse 6, let Reuben live and not die, and let, let not his men be few. For whatever reason this prophecy is there, we don't know, but let Reuben live and not die of course drinking you know wine in moderation and having some other good stuff when it comes to diets french people i think are long living they're happy they're having a very happy life from those even from those french movies i mentioned earlier you could see that some of the parties that french people can you know can can throw in they're just beautiful parties they just reminded me of course of us as well and you know as a culture we can well here in serbia we can well kind of fit in and we can well identify with them but you know let reuben live and not die that's interesting prophecy and also in genesis 29 verse 32 his mother leah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Eternal has looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. Because Reuben means see a son. Now how was this, and how is this prophecy, brethren, being fulfilled today? In these last days, which can, of course, last for two centuries. You know, the last days might be probably since the coming of Jesus Christ. We can say that, you know, the last days have become in these last days. He sent us his son, as it says in Hebrews, to testify of his might, of, of the fact that God does exist. So in the last two centuries, uh, and we are now in the 21st century, but in the 19th and 20th century, how was this fulfilled? Because remember again, in the 19th century, all of a sudden you see France losing its world dominance. And we see... At that time, an obscure two, na obscure two nations, Britain and America, rising to world power. Well, in the 19th century, France had the largest population, brethren, in Western Europe. French birth rate was among the highest in Europe after the Second World War, from 1945 until the late 1960s, when it became, began to decline. Nevertheless, it was still very high. The annual net increase of births over death stood at 250,000 to 350,000 until 1974. And because of this growth and immigration, the population increased from 41 million in 1946 to 53 million in 1977. 
Now, in of course, then later in the 80s, the birth rate was has continued to fall, but nevertheless remained higher than mo of most of other West European countries. Also, in 1801, France, with a population of 27 million, was the most populous country in Europe. By 1850, the population had grown to 36 million. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, however, the French birth rate dropped to levels lower than those in the rest of Europe, and France experienced a much slower rate of population growth than the rest of the continent. At the end of World War II, the population was only 40 million. However, after 1946, the birth rate rose to 21 per 1,000, a higher rate than had existed for more than a century. And although the rate fell to 18 per 1,000 in 1963 and to 14.9 per 1,000 in 1981, the period 1946 to 1982 witnessed an unprecedented expansion of the population that added 14 million people to France's school and later to the labor force and consumer markets. All of these things, brethren, you can find in Academic American Encyclopedia, Volume 1. Now, France's population of, of about, I think it's about 60 million now. Well, they have, they had like, you know, in 1985, they had like 55 millions of inhabitants on the mainland. That was the 17th in the world in size. But the slow growth of the French population, you may wonder, why is it? Brethren, it can be partly attributed to the bloody wars of the Napoleonic era and of 1940 through 1918, and to the war and post-war conditions of 1931 that lasted until 1946. It is estimated that one and a half million Frenchmen died in World War I and that they would, you know, they, they would have fathered some two million children if they had lived. Now the name Reuben, you can also see in some other names in Europe, like Narbonne, and the famous Italian town here, Ravenna, does sound like Reuben. In early 11th century Fran in uh, France, we find the country of Bourbon. There's a famous Bourbon wine today. And there is also a former kingdom in southern France, was called Navarre. You have this kind of uh, sound of Reuben, Navarre. And I think today in, 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 in Spain, there is a, one of the provinces called Navarre. So certainly part of the the northern Spaniards might be of Reubenite descent. And there's something else in Genesis 37, verse 20 through 30. If you read there, it's about Joseph's sons selling their brother alive. Well, to his credit, you see, brethren, if you read that story, Reuben wanted to save Joseph alive, unlike the other brothers. But he wasn't able to save his brother due to his instability due to his instability, which is also mentioned in James chapter 1, verse 8. You may wonder, well, what, what does James have to do with France, or with, the, with the tribes of Israel? Brethren, James, if you read the first very verse of the book of James, it was addressed to the twelve tribes in Diaspora. The brother of Christ, James, did know where the tribes were. At that time, when he was writing their, his epistle to them, there were some conflicts and bloody wars and instabilities among them so he's admonishing them that they will just devour one another if they continue so due to reuben's instability joseph was sold to slavery and as i said perhaps this same incident will happen on a national scale in the near future as other nations of europe sell america and britain into slavery as france stands by helplessly and I'm sure deep down in my heart that French toward the end of this whole time of age will deeply regret having alliance with Germany because when they realize it will be too late what the German intentions are because I'm sure that French are not aware of Psalm 83, Germany plotting to destroy, you remember Asher plotting to destroy the land of Israel and the nations of Israel, namely Anglo-Saxon people. I'm sure that France will then come to their senses, but too late. They'll just stand by helplessly and 
might just weep over the what is happening to American Britain, but they will be helpless and they will not be able to do anything. They will feel terrible. I hope that they will. And I hope that at that time, a good portion of them will repent. No wonder they will be the second exodus of Israel. They will be part of that because they are part of the lost Israelites. Hopefully they will then repent and realize what a grave mistake it was to get allied with their traditional enemies. Now, speaking yet in closing about France, brethren, there was uh, Gallia, Narbonensis, Narbonen, Narbonensis Gallia, a large country of Europe. It was called Galatia by the Greeks. And when I say Galatia, I'm sure that you are immediately reminded of the epistle to Galatians. The inhabitants in this Gallia were called Galli, Celtiberi and Celtoscythians. They called themselves Celts. The Greeks called them Galatians. Galatia. Galatia, Galatia. Now the Celts expanded in all directions from Central Europe. And as I might have mentioned to you, as they migrated from the shores of the Black Sea, many of them stayed behind, brethren, and many of them stayed here in Serbia. All of our major cities in Serbia were formed by Celts. The capital of Serbia, Belgrade, was actually named Singidunum. Dun, you feel it, the Dun, the Israelitish presence. Singidunum, which means the fortress on the banks of rivers. Belgrade lies on a very unique river mouth of the largest, longest, that is, river in on the Balkans and also on the river Danube. It's a very unique geographic position. And in the, in the world tomorrow, we are, who know various little secrets of Belgrade and how beautiful it was anciently, I'm sure we'll just restore it and make it even more beautiful. There are plenty of water on the Belgrade and plenty of uh, underground constructions that have been covered up by the communists and uh, forbidden to be discussed about. But we will discover all of that one of these days, brethren. We'll discover the rich history of Belgrade. Anyway, Singidunum is his name. Then the second also, the second largest town, one of the largest towns, Naisus, the birthright or birthplace of Constantine. Naisus, it was named by the Celts. Various other little towns of Serbia are named by the Celts. There are plenty of Celtic remains in this country. So you see, the Celts from this Central Europe, from, from the Balkans, they just uh, basically expanded into all directions from Central Europe, covered all the large area, even to France. Some Celts even invaded Italy and sacked Rome in 13, uh, 390 before Christ. Another group of Celts, this is interesting, moved back into Asia Minor in 280 before Christ, and the Greeks called them Galatians. The Greeks also called the Celts of Gaul Galatians. And therefore Paul's letter to the Galatians was possibly written to these Israelites who had lost their identity and religion. Just like all other Israel, lost Israel, the future of France is bright, nevertheless. Once, when we get past the Great Tribulation and Day of the Lord, what remains of French will be the second exodus. They'll be given their land back in the Holy Land. They'll be part of the restored Kingdom of Israel, ruled by resurrected King David. And French will indeed become model nation, as well as the rest of Israelitish tribes, to the rest of the world, who will then want to follow the same God and be grafted into Israel. That is a wonderful, marvelous plan God has always had with the house of Israel, and that's exactly what he has with, Fran with France. And I'm sure being a great friend of French people, the Serbian nation will look up to France one of these days again, will look up to France and will want to follow exactly the same God that they serve, the God of Israel.